also share share the presentations afterwards. Um, yes, my name is Åsa Ström Hildestrand and I work here at Norregio as project manager and I'm today's moderator. Um, the program uh, you probably saw on our website, but just to give a, a short glimpse of what we have ahead of us. First, we'll have an introduction to community sponsorship with our colleague from UNHCR. And then we'll hear reflections from one of the refugees who's actually been matched uh, and together with her welcoming guide from one of the Swedish municipalities doing a pilot program on community sponsorship. Following that, we'll hear more about the different models and programs uh, being tested and run uh, in the different Nordic countries. Um, and after that, it's your turn to come in and be able to ask questions as well to the different uh, country representatives who are here today. So please check out the Zoom chat. We have two colleagues, uh, Helena and Stefan, who are our chat moderators today. So check out the Zoom chat and uh, you can post questions uh, to the panelists, but also, of course, post your own links and, and references to the work that you're doing in this field. Because we know that there's a, a really broad uh, crowd of experience out there today uh, from all the Nordic countries and beyond, and that you work with this issue in, in different ways. So we would really like to hear from you as well. Um, anyways, after the panel discussion, questions and answers, we'll uh, wrap up the program just around three o'clock. Um, all right. Uh, anything else for now? I don't think so. But uh, keep keep your questions coming in the chat and we'll address them a little bit later. Right. I think it's time for our first speaker. And uh, that is Kaisa Kepsu, who is the project manager for our Nordic collaboration on integration of refugees. So Kaisa, please, very welcome. And tell us a little bit more about the, the collaboration we do and, and why. Thank you, Åsa. Uh, great to be here. And on behalf of the Nordic Welfare Center, I want to wish you all a uh, warm welcome for today's uh, collaboration. Uh, and uh, I'm a part of the same Nordic family as uh, also yeah. here at, uh, at Nordregio. We yeah, are exactly. collaborating closely on these issues. And we do have a common challenge in the Nordic countries in ensuring that uh, refugees, newly arrived minority groups, uh, can become uh, active members of society, find a home in the Nordics. Mm. And um, that is what we've been engaged in in this program since the start in 2016. That's when uh, the Nordic uh, governments decided that we need to collaborate more on this issue. Mm. And we want to provide uh, input and, and uh, knowledge and experiences for the national uh, settings uh, on um, how to create uh, initiatives and policy for an integration that works. Mm. Uh, and you have a strong focus on labor market integration. Uh, but today we'll talk more about the social integration. That could be the first step, right, for, for a successful Exactly. Inclusion. We're very much looking forward to hearing the initiatives from, from the different Nordic countries. And uh, we do we run also a platform um, on, on this knowledge and experience exchange on integrationnorden.org. So please uh, log in there for some inspiration and some knowledge. Um, what else do we do? We organize uh, webinars, mm -hmm. obviously, but also uh, other physical meetings so that people can actually meet. We think it's very important that mm -hmm. we meet each other here uh, from the Nordic countries and, and can share our experiences. We also provide uh, write new reports and, and uh, research based knowledge on, yes. on these issues that mm -hmm. we collaborate closely with. Collaboration with Nordregio. Nord Nord yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, we hope you will find today inspiring and find some some new thoughts and and knowledge that you can hopefully use in your work. Um, and we're happy uh, to collaborate with this. And um, 
Nordic Welfare Center. We have an office here in Stockholm and uh, in Helsinki. And there's also my colleague Stefan in the chat who works from our Helsinki office. Exactly. So. Again, reminder, uh, please use the chat to make yourselves known, your work known, and also post <clears throat> questions to us and our speakers. Thank you so much, Kaisa. Thank you, Asa. And that takes us over to our next speaker, uh, Erika Lövgren. You are the Senior Durable Solutions Associate at UNHCR. And you happen to have your office for the Nordics and Baltics here in Stockholm, which I think is very handy for us. So we have now this uh, collaboration uh, going. But tell us a little bit more about the community sponsorship program and how you've adjusted it to the to the Nordic countries. Thank you also. Thank you for having, having us. And on behalf of UNHCR and Nordic and Baltic countries, I would also like to warmly welcome you to this very inspiring and interesting seminar that we have been looking forward to for a long time. We are very happy to see, as, as Osa was mentioning, that so many have registered for today's event. So we hope that you're all online now or are still registering. So, and please, uh, as Osa was saying, keep asking questions a bit later. I would also like to thank so much for this great cooperation and for hosting the event from Nord Regius uh, Studio. And also thanking, of course, uh, Kaisa from Nordic Welfare Center for this collaboration yet again. It's fantastic to have collab collaborations with, with you. Uh, and uh, but as also was saying before we get started with this very interesting presentations from the Nordic countries and the initiatives, uh, which are community sponsorship initiatives and similar initiatives, I would just like to give you a very brief background to the community sponsorship concept and how we ended up here in the Nordic countries. So uh, just to start with, um, you can get to the next slide. Oh, no, yes, sorry. Um, so, uh, just for you all to kind of know how we got into the whole Nordic model. Uh, so, it's uh, the Nordic uh, community sponsorship model is based on the Canadian model from uh, 79, so it's a very old model, uh, where private individuals in, in Canada uh, commit to providing emotional, financial and practical support to refugees for a designated period of time. Uh, and UNHCR has been involved in the development of community sponsorship programs in uh, in the Nordics, but also all around Europe and, and globally uh, for quite some years. And we have also, uh, through our partner, the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, have also uh, become a significant support in this process. Uh, what we have done from our side, I mean, UNHCR in this part of the world is primarily an advocacy actor. And what we have done in that uh, effect is that we have raised awareness on the concept and we have supported the development of feasibility studies and working groups. And of course, in close collaboration with the stakeholders that we are all seeing today. So what has happened since we started uh, a few years ago is that a couple of pilot programs have been launched in the region. And uh, we also realized throughout the process that this Canadian model needed to be a bit adopted to the uh, welfare model that we have in the Nordic countries. And we saw that there was also a specific need that we wanted to focus on. And that was what has already been mentioned today, the social inclusion and social needs and the practical and emotional support that you need when you come as a newly arrived to a new country. And something that is also under discussion is uh, the pre-departure matching for quota refugees. But that's something that is still under discussion. I'm not going to the details and I want to get started with the presentations. But just for you to have a little bit more of an understanding of what it means with this Nordic model is that refugees are supported uh, by a group of volunteers uh, or individual welcome guides from arrival. There is, uh, in comparison then to the Canadian model, there is no additionality. So for now, it's part of the traditional, it's part of the traditional national resettlement programs that we have in the Nordic countries, in all the Nordic countries. Uh, and uh, what we have seen, though, is that due to a decrease in resettlement quota the last few years, in some of the countries, uh, the community sponsorship initiatives has also opened up to other refugees, so not only quota refugees, but also persons who are arriving as spontaneous arrivals. Uh, we have also in the Nordic model removed the financial component. And uh, we also see that what we are building is in, it's in addition to existing integration systems. So it's not that we are adding on something that doesn't exist, but we are building on, on the 
the current initiatives that exist and, uh, and also on local structures. And we have seen that these models that have been developing and which you will hear more about very soon, uh, they have increased the cooperation between the national and the regional and local authorities and civil society actors. And this is very valuable because we see that all these actors need to come together to make the reception and integration of newly arrivals the most successful. So just moving uh, to the last bit of this. So uh, as you heard, the, the idea is then that volunteers and groups of volunteers are acting, are supporting these newly arrivals. And what we see that the main function is removing all the other parts from the Canadian model then is that uh, that they should be as act as entry points into local society to, to be the ones that get to to tell about how does it work in the Swedish society or in or in the Icelandic society or a Danish society and so on and uh, where do you go I mean how do you if you don't know one anyone where do you go to shop I mean what are the more kind of basic issues that you need to know how do you do you get into sports associations and so on um, what is also an integral part of the models that have been developed is support and training for volunteers. So the ones that are included in these programs, they are all being trained beforehand. They are also in connection to these initiatives. They have also been developed meeting points and organized activities for the refugees and for the volunteers so that they go there together. And the long term goal that we have with these initiatives and I should say we, because I'm kind of saying, going back to the slide before, we do this all together, the different actors that have been mentioned. And our role is to support that, our role as UNHCR. But what we hope is that these type of initiatives can be included in a more, in a more structural and long-term model that would stay in the national systems. So that you, by default, when you arrive to a Nordic country, you would be offered to get a welcome guide that can support you in the first in the trip in your in the integration into the society. Um, what we see as well is a very good uh, effect of getting faster into into the society is of course the well-being of the individuals who are arriving. That's the most important. But then we also see that this is something that um, leads to more welcoming societies. It can also decrease the burden and fin financial, but also the um, resource, the social burden on reception and integration systems. And in, in, it can lead to an increased amount of um, numbers uh, of um, actors and capacity of actors who are involved in integration and in the inclusion process. And I mean, maybe to put it very easily and to, as a final word, we think that the most important part of this model is that the human encounter is key. That's mm -hmm. what we need for people who are coming new to our countries so that they feel welcomed and that they feel included in society. And now I'm very much looking forward, looking at you also, that now we need to move <laughs> forward to hearing from all the fantastic speakers that we have today. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Erika. That was important background about community sponsorship. And as we heard, it, it comes from the Canadian program that I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of as well, but has then been tweaked to work in a Nordic welfare society context. But still, the main main issue is, is to create this, these meetings between locals and newcomers and, and create a more sustainable way to make people feel included in their new community. And now with us, uh, we have one of uh, uh, a, a person who actually came as a refugee from Sudan uh, not too long ago, uh, Jila Abdal Krim uh, and her welcome guide, Lee Neil, uh, who both live in uh, Dandryd municipality just outside of Stockholm. And uh, they are part of one of these pilot programs and we have you with us today. So very welcome. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, we thought that you would be the, the, the best person to start this, this uh, program by, by giving a few reflections from, from a refugee point of view. What, what could this uh, program uh, mean uh, to you in, in your everyday life and as a newcomer in, in Dandryd? So looking forward to hear your reflections. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Siti Gila Abdelkarim, but you can call me Gila. I come uh, from Sudan. 
I come to Sweden in uh, December of uh, uh, 2028 with my two daughters. Uh, I had 20 years and uh, Isar who eight, who eight years. Um, I feel good about living in Sweden. I feel good about living in Sweden. It has the best life and the best education. It is better than uh, in war. Here I found security and I can live a decent life. When I come to Sweden, I had so many things to do. So many things I must do, like immigration, scatter market, and more <laughs> in Dandrit uh, County. Uh, we have case worker, workers uh, that can help with those uh, practical things. To welcome guide program is uh, different from the practical help I get from my case manager. I first uh, heard about the welcome guide program when uh, Emmanuel contact my case manager. Emmanuel told me that this program would help me with uh, Swedish and I could ask my welcome guide question about life in Sweden and others kind help like education, medicine, practical things and I can practice my Swedish. Oh. Emmanuel had several people who were interested in the program, but he matched me with Lee. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so now I have a friend, Lee, who can help me with the Swedish language and who can help me in the Swedish society also. also. <laughs> I have small uh, uh, difficulties in uh, Swedish language. I still find it difficult to speak fluently. Lee added to me life by doing language practice, doing activity together, visiting our meeting place, and that helped me to come into society and know how the society is working. My daughter Ayat also has a welcome guide who has helped her to change school and find a book she needs for her class. And at last, the welcome guide program helped me to integrate better into Swedish society and improve my Swedish without being afraid or confused. It gave me moral courage. This program helped us to cook, to cook and overcome life alone so that your voice and opinion can be heard. This program is important and it must be continuous because more refugees come who need education and integration in addition to practical things. People really need the help it provides. 
Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and reflections. Uh, and I think it gives very strong testament to the importance of uh, these kind of programs. And maybe you two wouldn't have met otherwise. And I mean, it, it, we all know living in the Scandinavian countries that it can be hard to, to find new friends. Uh, we have a special way of socializing in the Nordics compared to many other countries. We're actually usually at the bottom of the list uh, of indexes about finding new friends. So I think it also gives extra, uh, yeah, it's it's extra important in the Nordic countries to 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 have these kind of, of programs. Uh, and you also pointed out several things that that you you got as as uh, well where you could get help from Lee, etc. So uh, I would yeah, I was just uh, also curious to hear from you, Lee. How 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 did you find out about the program, or why did you get engaged, and what what do you feel that you have got out of it so far? Well, I suppose to take what you just said. Um, it came at me from two two ways. When I was, I'm from the US and I've been in Sweden for 25 years. When I was growing up in Texas, um, we were part of a program called Host Family. So my parents, my aunt and uncle, my grandmother, we all were host families for three PhD students at the local university that came from Egypt. And that connection sponsored a lifetime friendship. And uh, so that was really, part of what I grew up with. And so I so I remembered that. But then also, exactly as you said, I moved, I lived in several different countries before I came to Sweden. And it's quite difficult to find local friends. It's very much easier to hang out with just the people that you know or even be alone than it is to actually meet locals and actually understand the society from their point of view. So um, having done that myself and having worked hard to you know somewhat come into Swedish society and make friends and things I wanted to share that a bit more with others mm. so I found the program online I'd been involved our county has several activities that they do there's a once a week language cafe in the in the library and there's a meeting point where they that everyone gathers every week mm. and I tried to get involved with those a few years ago um, but at that point I had children at home and lots of scheduling conflicts. And it was really hard to do that. And then COVID happened and all of that kind of changed. So when I saw this program online, I thought, well, this is something that I could actually do and get involved in. So do you also uh, sometimes meet uh, as a larger group that you and several of the welcoming guides and also other friends uh, from the refugee community come together at this meeting place, Mötesplatsen? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So they do social activities there as well. They do, and lots of information as well. So um, they usually have an invited guest or an invited group to come and talk about some aspect of society. So as well, in addition to just the communication that happens. And, uh, and um, in, in your opinion, uh, what, what would be your sort of best advice to other uh, municipalities who might be thinking of starting this kind of program? Are there specific things that they should think of that are important to make it work well? Um, I guess that, as I said, there's sort of three, you know, there's sort of three parts to it. There's the practical help that everyone absolutely needs. And then the meeting place, so the, that provides connections for within the group of refugees to meet each other and also for the volunteers to be involved. But this is like a little bit extra. It's a bit more personal contact. And I think it, um, I don't know, I mean, matching has, to, I, I said I would be happy to be matched with anybody, but I was really happy to be matched with another mother. Mm -hmm. um, she has, her daughter is, her older daughter is the same age as my younger son, and her younger daughter goes to the school that my children went to. So it gives mm -hmm. us more points of connection. So I do think that in the matching. The matching is important. It is important. You have to find some points of interest. Mm -hmm. um, it is the language difficulties I think gilles has been here for two years and she's been doing Swedish for immigrants and she's highly motivated to speak Swedish. Yeah. And her girls are, are, are fantastic. They've been in school all day. They have a big advantage when you're eight, you know, mm. it's a bit different. <laughs> but it is, the language is a challenge and I think it would have been much more so at the very beginning. Mm. So we've had some help from a neighbor came and helped us translate once just to talk about some more difficult issues. 
And then Sheila's older daughter can also act as a translator sometimes when we need a bit of additional help mm -hmm. so that we don't always have to go to Google. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you want to add to that? You, you, <laughs> you also find this uh, su language support is an important aspect of this program to, to get to practice your Swedish, I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably it is. It's important, and we play. But sometimes it's nice to just do something fun. The other day we met, and we went through all of the dialogues from her class, and uh, then we played a kids' card game, Go Fish, which I guess Finzi Yeah, 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 yeah. She won. She has a really big competitive streak. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so just some fun things to do that help with the language as well. Yeah. Very well. Um, any other thing that you want to highlight here, uh, how the what the program has has meant to you? I mean, I think you said said the most in uh, most of it in in your in your uh, first reflections here. But any other important takeaway for? I think, from my perspective, it's important that Sheila has an opportunity to see parts of Sweden that she might not otherwise see. Mm. I'm really looking forward to it not being quite so icy. <laughs> so we can go outside and take some walks and, you know, and enjoy what Sweden truly has to offer. Mm. Um, and, and it's kind of the things that you might not think about when you're trying to open a bank account and find mm. a job and learn Swedish, mm. but the, the beautiful parts about it, too. Mm. Yeah. And, and that you have a personal relationship now that can also mm. grow with time and, mm. and develop your interests together. Sounds like a good idea. I think we had a question here from the chat. So let me just check my little device. Uh, or I think, okay, this, this will be for, for later, I think. Uh, it's from, from the, it's more about which refugee population are the arriving individuals chosen from? I think that's maybe not the question for you, because because you in the program where you are, I think for the municipality, it's it's all the refugees who have come as quota refugees or or other refugees that are involved. But we'll hear more, and that's probably the segue to our next speaker, who is uh, Anna Giselius from Dandrud, who works with the program. But thank you so much for coming, for joining us today, and for giving us a better idea of of what this program really means for refugees and welcome guides. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, all right. Yes, so our our next speaker is Anna Giselius, who is integration officer and project manager for the pilot uh, community sponsorship program happening in Danderyd municipality. So very welcome, Anna. And you're one of four municipalities, as far as I know, in Sweden who are now testing this model. So we're curious to hear more about, from your point of view, how it's working. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And also I'd like to thank uh, Gila and Lee for sharing their experiences of our program in Dandrid. It was really nice uh, to hear directly from them. So my, my name is Anna Giselius, and I work for a municipality in Sweden called Dandrid. We are a rather small municipality within the Swedish context with approximately 33,000 inhabitants and we're located in the northern part of the Stockholm region. I'm the project manager of our community-based sponsorship program and I will speak about some key elements about our program. Uh, community sponsorship is called um, Ideal Flyktingstad in Swedish, which translates to voluntary refugee assistance which is a more accurate term uh, within our context, because the Swedish model differs from the original community sponsorship based ID, as it doesn't involve any financial contribution from the sponsors. And as you heard, we don't even refer to them as sponsors. We, we call them welcome guides. So Ideal Flicking Study operates as a volunteer program in Sweden and complements the already existing uh, integration structure in Sweden with all associated costs covered by public actors. In, in Danderyd, we are currently in a pilot project phase, which began on the 1st of January 2023 and will conclude now end of April 2024. And the project phase is funded by the Stockholm County Administrative Board. We see many benefits of the method in our municipality. And once the 
pilot phase concludes next month, community sponsorship will be implemented in Dunderid as part of our regular programming, and we will no longer have any external funding. As Erika spoke about, uh, community sponsorship is a method to facilitate the integration process of newcomers through the engagement of local citizens. And in, Dund in Dundred, the program is being implemented in close cooperation with the local civil society in our area. We could truly not do it without our NGO partner. And we can really see how the, me how the method benefits not only the, the newcomers, but also the overall local community um, in our municipal area. And as community sponsorship is new in Sweden still, and we were the first uh, municipality to start working with this, uh, an additional aim for us is to share the results and the experiences with other municipalities in Sweden and support them in uh, implementing the method. So currently we, we were four, uh, but we're currently actually seven municipalities now working with this in different parts of Sweden. And we have a network where we meet online on a monthly basis and we share experiences and materials with each other. And we also have a central monitoring and evaluation component in the project in cooperation with a Swedish university called Uppsala University. And they're conducting a comparative evaluation of the model and its effects in the different uh, municipal areas. And the aim is to establish an evidence-based practice within the Swedish context. And I think Gila, she described it really well, what community sponsorship is about. And it matters because it targets exactly what many of the newcomers tell us is the most important aspect when arriving as a refugee to Sweden, the feeling of being welcomed into the community. And integration is of course so much more than what we as case officers can, can do in an office. It's, there is a central social component to integration that requires personal interaction between people in the context of real life. And that is what community sponsorship provides, I believe. It works as an icebreaker <laughs> into the society. Uh, it was relatively easy for us to implement community sponsorship uh, in Dandrid as we had a strong reception system. And foremost, we have a very engaged local uh, civil society. We're, we're partnering with a local NGO called An Utrecht Hand, uh, and they're responsible to help with arranging uh, social activities within the program. Uh, so every Thursday evening, as Gila and Lee spoke about, we have activities in a place called the Meeting Point in Dunderid, where locals and newcomers can meet and have something light to eat and drink, fika, as we say in Swedish, very, very important here. And they can practice the Swedish language and do various activities together, uh, such as, for example, like growing vegetables and, and flowers as seen here in, in the photo. And the meeting point is operated mainly by, by volunteers from our NGO partner. And it's a great way for those being matched within the community sponsorship program uh, to spend time with each other without having the social responsibility of having to come up with activities themselves. They're of course welcome to do that if they would like to, but this is something as we offer as a social platform within the program. Mm. Wait, here. Uh, shortly about our program uh, design. It's developed by inspiration and support from DRSI, the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. And we have an online registration form uh, for local citizens interested in becoming welcome guides. And once they sign up, we, we contact them and agree on a time to meet for a mandatory training session, which takes approximately two hours. And during the training session, we explain what the program is about. Uh, we talk about the context and situation for, for quota refugees and discuss various expectations and concerns. And we also ask the welcome guide to sign a code of contact prior to being matched. And equally important is, of course, to have a similar dialogue with the beneficiary household in order to clarify uh, questions and expectations from their side about the program. Uh, and currently, uh, refugees being resettled to Dandred are offered to participate in our community sponsorship program immediately upon arrival. Ideally, however, we'd like to be able to connect uh, the newcomers and their welcome guides even before arriving to Sweden through a phone or video call. And we're in dialogue with the Swedish Migration Board about this, and we hope to be able to start or to pilot this uh, during this year. Because I think that to be able to speak and get to know each other a little before arrival would really enhance the experience, both for the person that's arriving to Sweden, to know that there is someone actually there waiting for you who's not 
paid to do so is not a caseworker like me, but someone who's really invested in the successful uh, integration of that person. And it would also, of course, enhance the experience for the welcome guide that they met before uh, arrival. And also it will strengthen our reception capacity, I believe, as a municipality, if the welcome guides could be involved in meeting the newcomers directly from, from day one, maybe even at the airport when, when they arrive. Final slide. <laughs> Uh, so since since last year, we have matched 23 households uh, consisting of 60 newcomers, including 25 children, with local individuals or families in Dunderd. And we can see many positive outcomes of the method. Uh, community sponsorship really benefits both the, the newcomers and our community alike. So by being welcomed by local citizens invested in the successful settlement uh, of refugees, we see that the newcomers, they pick up the Swedish language more quickly they learn to better navigate the new community and they build networks and friendships. It really contributes to create a feeling of belonging in the new country. But the program also strengthens us, I believe, as a host community by promoting a more welcoming and inclusive community by bringing together people from different backgrounds and various life experiences. And by fostering these uh, positive effects of community sponsorship at local levels, a polarized political like narratives about refugee reception can begin to shift. We see how the program generates like so many positive stories, and I really think it has the potential to increase the public support for, for refugee reception. Uh, in the context uh, shortly about sustainability in, in Sweden, I believe that the, the fact that the program is being driven by municipalities in Sweden uh, is a positive factor that it enhances its sustainability as the program becomes an integrated component of the official refugee reception uh, system. And this can help, I believe, a lot the long term durability and is also possible positive for from a financial stability point of view as local authorities uh, carry the costs. And I would like to end with uh, quoting the High Commissioner of the UNHCR, Filippo Grandi, whom we had the honor of meeting last year. And he said that there is a lot of talk from politicians right now about the general public being negative uh, towards more immigrants. And this may be true, but there is also a lot of solidarity. And he said that community sponsorship is something that gives him hope. And I can only agree with him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for, for sharing these, uh, these words and learnings. I mean, you've obviously worked really hard to create a structured program and to also really invite all the, all the newcomers into the program. Um, also really promising to hear that this is now moving from a project-based, project-funded uh, uh, initiative to, to something that you will do as part of your regular integration work. So I don't know if you, just a final comment, what, was it difficult to to uh, to, uh, um, to to make, make sure your your politicians agreed to this, or, or was it was it easy to to uh, to share these these results and get them on board? Um, yes, we're very happy about that as well. And no, I wouldn't say it was difficult. The program kind of sold itself mm -hmm. because we can see so many of the positive effects mm. from it, mm. and. Uh, no, so it was not difficult, and I'm happy that we can move forward in, in this way. And I'm sure other municipalities can learn from you as well on how to also explain the, the success factors and, and how to make it work the most best possible way. But thank you so much again, and we'll hear more from you in the panel discussion a little bit later. And again, a reminder, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat, but keep them coming and we'll pick them up as we move to the to the panel discussion. But now uh, we have our next speaker, so we'll move to Finland and we'll hear from from Johanna. Uh, Johanna Mantikainen from the Finnish Red Cross, and you are coordinating a pilot program in Finland with uh, some 15 different municipalities yeah, yeah. across Finland. Yes. So uh, there are similarities definitely with the Swedish program, but also I'm sure uh, special uh, Finnish features. So please uh, tell us more. Yes, thank you. Uh, dear participants, it's a great pleasure to present you um, the activities of the pilot project led by the Finnish Red Cross in Finland. We just started a year ago uh, in January. This pilot is a three-year community-based integration pilot 
and it's implemented in cooperation between the Red Cross headquarters, four Red Cross districts, the Humak University of Applied Sciences and the Finnish, Red Cro uh, Finnish Church Council. And they are great partners. It's a great pleasure to work together. Um, we have quarter refugees in Finland uh, for, for decades, but um, unfortunately uh, for this year on, we will have only five quarter refugees a year. And it might cause us a little bit uh, difficulties because our, our um, Uh, the target group of our pilot is for for um, no, quarter refugees, but nevertheless, we go on what we have. I start with this. Um, we don't start with what a zero level because we had a great um, supporting integration, supporting volunteers for for years and decades. Um, as you see. There are a lot of different activities for, for newcomers, and we have been developing these um, models and concepts for years. Um, myself, I've been developing these models for 30 years already in Finland. So um, this is very good work, and there's a lot of different organizations who run these activities. And um, we are wondering if we talk about community sponsorship programs or community mentors, community de development, what's the difference? Do we work as a as, um, usual way to, 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 um, to make these traditional supporting integration activities, or can we have something more? when we have these um, uh, uh, community sponsorship programs. And um, this is our starting point. Those, this is what we already have. And what extra can we bring? That's what we are um, thinking or, or uh, looking for. We have some very big uh, words here. And this I, we keep in mind that we have to have some more, some social inclusion and empowerment with strong involvement of refugees themselves more than before. We have to create welcoming communities and we have to have open and positive contacts between participants. And um, I think it's great to have an opportunity to, to uh, recruit and coach new community mentors and they are the ones who could uh, add some more extra value to, to our uh, integration uh, uh, activities. Uh, we have uh, three special goals for this pilot project. And the one is for refugees. We hope that they will have more social contacts and they have more opportunities for personal integration via matching and mentoring. And of course, equal participation is crucial question here. We have uh, goal number two, which goes for community mentors. What we want to do is to have inspiring voluntary work for them uh, and, and train and coach and support them in their activities. And the uh, goal number three goes for the concept. So which will be the best practices uh, for community development, community work? Um, can we have some new perspectives for community involvement? And of course, recommendations for future as well. So far, well, we have 10 uh, employees in different parts of Finland. We have at the moment 14 municipalities involved and maybe two more coming. 
we have uh, our basic concept is integration platform and i will tell something some something more about it later to collect uh, those uh, uh, active organizations individuals and um, officials together we have uh, at, at far uh, four community mentor coaching organized already and about uh, 35 community mentors trained And I have two maps here. So these are our municipalities at the moment. And you can see they are uh, different parts of Finland. And um, all of them are municipalities who take uh, quota, they take quota refugees. Maybe they are newcomers also for as a municipalities or they have a long history of receiving refugees. <laughs> And what we are doing with the municipalities, the pilot stuff meets refugees there, authorities, organizations, and other stakeholders in a local level, so we can combine uh, good uh, groups for, for, for this activity. And we are going to develop our cooperation in, in, um, in the cities and, and towns. And in this uh, picture and map, you can see that we have all kinds of all different sizes municipalities involved. So we have very small uh, municipalities with three and a half thousand people and then some big cities. So it's very good because we have a different experience of, of uh, how how does it work in in different different kind of of places locations in in finland and one uh, final thing is the one of the concepts i would like to uh, share with you it's an integration platform for organizations and this is the main concept we are using or in new communities and in new uh, municipalities to collect people uh, together and discuss what, what they already have for integration and put all these uh, different parties together to make uh, a personal uh, municipal map of uh, of the activities we already have. So um, this is what we uh, are doing and I would like to to share this uh, integration platform with you as well. So this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna, Thank for you. that. And that was a bit of a complex slide. So I would say I would recommend for for anyone to contact you directly who yes. wants to know. It's it's hard to to present in a few minutes uh, a, a complex uh, concept like yeah, your, your yeah, platform here. Yeah. Uh, but just so we understand, so I think it sounds like a very wise thing to do to start with a mapping of what are the already happening and the different yeah. activities and services provided for refugees. But you also have this element that we heard from Danderud about matching yeah. locals uh, more one-on-one -on -one with the refugees. So you get the personal welcome guide or is yes, this a different yeah, concept? Yeah. I don't know yet no? because no we are just in the beginning of, of matching process because okay. we only had this coaching or training trainings uh, just a couple of months ago mm -hmm. and and we want to people uh, decide themselves mm. what kind of activities they are, are going to to start of mm -hmm. course we have some ideas mm. but of course we have to also wait for them mm. to to uh, start planning together. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mentors and refugees yeah. together. Yeah. And the municipalities will, will still have also a key role in terms of, of keeping track of the new refugees coming and yeah. making sure that all of them get this offer to be part yeah. of these activities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johanna. Thank you. And Thank you. for you out there, post any questions in the chat and we'll come back to them. And Johanna, you will also come back here soon. Yeah.
But first, we'll hear from Iceland, uh, where we have Soren Paulina Jonsdottir, uh, who works for uh, as policy advisor for Amnesty in Iceland. And Amnesty, as we all know, is also very much an international organization. And that means you've tried uh, different kinds of uh, community sponsorships programs in also in other countries. So you're building on those international experiences, but also hopefully some Nordic experiences. But uh, please tell us a bit more about the situation in uh, Iceland. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, being invited to be here because um, it's going to be very important for us Icelanders to learn from our colleagues in, in the north that already have experience and are, have started their um, projects with community sponsorship. Uh, the first slide I have here uh, is in Icelandic because this is the name we use in Iceland. Um, oh, well, sorry, my name is Thorin Paulina Jonsdottir. I am uh, a lawyer and policy advisor at uh, the Icelandic section of Amnesty International and also a project manager for community sponsorship. Uh, we named community sponsorship in Iceland Bakjartar Flotta Folks. And the direct translation of that is allies of refugees. Um, there's been some talk about how to word uh, things in, in the movement behind community sponsorship. Some people have an, an issue with sponsors and want it to be more friendly, allies, things like that. And I noticed that the Swedes, they talk about welcome guides. And we would like to talk about allies. And I hope this is going to be the name that sticks when we finally start our program because already now we, we do not have a community sponsorship program in Iceland but I, I believe and hope that that will change soon. I'm pushing down. It's not working. Oh, okay. So over the past few years Amnesty International offices on four continents have been working to support refugees in a way and on a different level than before. The goal is to increase the number of people that, who can start their lives in a safe country. And the method that Amnesty has been focusing on uh, is community sponsorship. Uh, at present, several of our national offices are committed to advancing community sponsorship. They are working with governments, civil society and stakeholders, like the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative that has already been mentioned here today. Um, to establish new programs or make existing ones more sustainable, accessible and effective. Uh, more Amnesty offices are also actively engaged in the development of community sponsorship, starting conversations, exploring possibilities and developing plans. Tremendous progress has been made around the world, something I've actually experienced uh, in terms of uh, reflection, um, and um, speeches and, and, and lots of wonderful stories uh, at conferences that have been held by Amnesty International and GRSI, the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative before mentioned, um, where um, over 100 uh, people, 130 people come together now in the past two years uh, with representatives from 20 something countries, all that have been involved in uh, community sponsorship programs uh, at some level in these countries. So it's been very inspiring. And you can see when you actually meet these people that uh, it's been so uh, powerful. And this is a great movement that is actually building. And together with local and international partners, it shows that even in the midst of hostility and suspicion, ordinary people can build communities of welcome and hope, something we desperately need these days. Amnesty wants to take part in this conversation and emphasizes nine key elements that need to be part of a community sponsorship programs. Uh, I, I want to reiterate, this is the Amnesty International on a global level um, key elements. So we're not focused on exa exactly all of them in Iceland because we're also going for more of a Nordic model. But these key elements are the following, human rights, well, human right focus. A sponsorship system should be solidly grounded in human rights principles and not set up as a purely humanitarian or charity-based program. This means, for instance, that refugees 
should be given as much ownership as feasible over decisions made about their sponsorship and settlement. A kind of nothing about us without us element. The second one is addition or additionality. And this is the one that doesn't actually correlate very much with the Nordic um, approach uh, today because we are talking about within the quota system, but we would like it to be the end goal. So what we're talking about here is that community sponsorship should be an addition, uh, not a replacement of government-led programs to resettle refugees. Transparency. The government should engage in effective and timely communication with both refugees and sponsorship groups to ensure everyone's understanding of their respective roles and responsibilities, as well as to manage expectations, especially with respect to processes and timelines. Training. Sponsors should receive, or allies, should receive consistent comprehensive and ongoing training on relevant issues, including cultural sensitivity, trauma and mental health, and public services available to refugees. Access to health care or access to basic services. Refugees who arrive through community sponsorship should have access to basic government services. Regardless of their precise legal status when they arrive, they, we consider that sponsored refugees should have access to free education, basic health care, including for mental health and language classes for adults. Surveillance or oversight. There should be an independent body to oversee sponsorship arrangements with the authority to receive complaints, manage disputes and if serious problems arise, take responsibility to ensure that refugees basic needs are met. Monitoring. A means for monitoring and evaluating the program should be built in from the start to enable the government and civil society to track progress, address challenges and adapt the program. Role of civil society. In our view, in the early years of a new community sponsorship program, established civil society groups and their members should take the lead. Once the system is well established, it can be expanded to include groups of citizens who aren't necessarily connected to a civil society group, as is now the case in the Canadian model, and many more actually. Non-discrimination or equality, the government should ensure as far as possible consistency in the timelines and levels of support experienced by all refugees regardless of the country of origin or of their manner of arrival, government resettled, privately sponsored, in-country asylum claim, and whatnot. And now to the situation in Iceland. Uh, the Icelandic section of Amnesty International decided uh, around 2017 to start looking into community sponsorship and had a feasibility study made in 2019, which uh, gave more grounds to uh, us deciding to promote the, the, the community sponsorship. The attitude, the atmosphere was positive, and there was a general feeling that this would be something that Icelanders would like to take up. Um, Considering uh, things that have changed quite a bit since 2019, we, we do realize that we might need to make a new feasibility study uh, on the grounds that there's a lot more people moving around refugees and uh, we've also noticed quite a, a flux uh, or change in attitudes and polarization like we've seen many places else in Europe, unfortunately. So they're not as positive, but we, we do believe that we have a, a, a great ground to work with, especially when we look at the interest of Icelanders in uh, helping out the Ukrainians with after the invasion of Russia in, into the Ukraine. And we want to build on that, um, that mentality. So in our work in Iceland, uh, we have discussed with lots of uh, um, different entities many that have something to do with welcoming uh, refugees in Iceland, uh, municipalities, NGOs, the Red Cross, uh, hosted some workshops, 
We've used every opportunity possible to talk to the parliament uh, when we write bills on um, or reviews on bills on foreign affairs in terms of foreign laws, uh, foreign law and or the Green Book on the policy of immigrant, immigrant and refugee affairs. And we are even taking part in pa panel uh, discussions at the University of Iceland where we were the only neutral party while the rest was uh, uh, politicians of very opposite views on, on immigrants and, and refugees, but could actually uh, be connected through the notion of community sponsorship with a very positive um, uh, response from them. So that was also quite hopeful for us to hear. And now, to, finally, at the, I can mention that we actually were, were allowed to uh, got the opportunity to present community sponsorship for the Minister of Social Affairs in December, and uh, he was he gave us quite a positive response, um, and was even seemed to be keen on starting a pilot program in Iceland. So uh, now I'm hoping that the the working group that he has put together on um, migrant and refugee affairs will be open to uh, starting such a pilot. I'm sure some of them are actually listening right now. All right. Thank Just... you so much, Thorun, for giving that uh, perspective from Iceland and also, of course, uh, the wider perspective from, from Amnesty uh, and the, the principles uh, where uh, many of them are, are definitely already implemented in these pilots that we heard about earlier. Uh, so uh, I, I was just curious: Have you have you received or heard any interest uh, already from uh, Icelandic municipalities that have have received uh, refugees if they are interested in in trying the model? I mean, is there an awareness also at the local level about these kinds of programs? Yes, that's been the feeling. Uh, they they are positive towards it, but they also do point out that there is lots of. Um, other entities that are already in this field welcoming and have know-how experience and all that but we actually just would would like to build on that exactly and, that's, yes. a, that's a key word that we heard today right you build on existing structures but maybe the add-on with with this uh, more systematic approach is to make sure that all refugees who are settled in a certain municipality actually get the offer of a welcoming exactly. guide or similar Yes, but best of luck with, with your work in Iceland. Thank you And you'll much. also be back soon. But before that, we'll also hear from Denmark. And we have Mats Tanning Vestergaard from the Danish Red Cross here today. And you're the, the project manager for Friends Show the Way. Yes. And you actually started uh, started out without considering this specific uh, way of programming. But yeah. it's, it's uh, well, there are a lot of similarities. So, Indeed, so yeah. tell us more. And this kicked off already in 2016. Yes. Uh, with yes. with the, with the big influx of, of refugees from yeah. Syria, etc. Right. So so yeah. you have also some experience now yes. of, of working with this. So very well. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as I said, um, or as you said, I'm the project manager and I'm with the Red Cross, but we are implementing this uh, in a partnership with the Danish Refugee Council. Um, as you said, we started in 2016 with the influx of Syrian refugees and that post um, also in Denmark a big, a big challenge uh, how to handle it um, and this project became a civil society response to from the Red Cross and the Danish Refugee Council of how to to handle that um, that challenge and the project has been uh, government funded ever since. Now the project um, has become nationwide. We have more than 100 volunteer groups. Um, we uh, are active in more than 80 out of Denmark's 98 municipalities. And we have um, matched um, 11,000, more, more than 11,000 refugees since we started. And at the moment, we have about 3,000 volunteers involved. And so the the, the what we have managed together, the two organizations, is that we made sure that no matter where you're being placed in Denmark, you can you can uh, get a volunteer friend and the municipalities know where to look if they want uh, to be part of this. Our target group is wider than just quota refugees. It's also spontaneous refugees and displaced from Ukraine and all, all refugees with uh, protection status in Denmark, as well as reunited family members of refugees. 
both newly arrived and, and those who've been in Denmark for some time. So what is it? Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one support initiative where we build on relations between people developing over time. It's what we call a befriending initiative. It's a more holistic approach than um, a mentoring project, for instance. And those involved can be both individuals and families. The idea is pretty simple, actually. When you're new, there's a lot of things you don't know. And um, we see that in all the, the activities or the, the initiatives here. That, that you get someone who can guide you both locally and also in society as such. And it's someone who can give you practical help also with digital challenges, which we see is, is, is quite uh, dominant. It's someone who can help you understand official communication, someone who can help read uh, letters from the municipality, for instance, help you find a job and keep it by um, it's sort of explaining how Danish work culture work and um, importantly someone you can practice Danish with and if you're a parent then um, how does parenting look in Denmark how does it work if you have a, a child in school and so forth and importantly it's also someone you can socialize with without an agenda and that's where the relations building come in. And it's also someone who can give you psychosocial support because um, being a, a refugee, it, it's, um, it can be strainful. You're away from home, you have experienced loss and, and you're under emotional stress a lot of the time. So have to have someone who can, can give you psychosocial support um, is quite in, uh, important. So to sum up, you can, it, describe this as being a needs-based initiative that takes um, sort of evolves around um, the refugee. It's a human to human uh, uh, initiative that goes both ways. There's no money involved between um, the parties. The volunteers don't follow any strict manuals or methodology, but the organization, so to speak, set up a framework for these people to meet and um, and it becomes a supplement to government uh, integration efforts. Um, to be very practical um, and, and maybe give a sort of an inspiration of how to how, how we construct this, um, I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at, at the relationship, relationship between the local stakeholders in the project. So we have a, a consultant um, from one of the two organizations and they will help establish a cooperation agreement with the municipality and they also recruit a local coordinator who is a volunteer the municipality on their hand they present the offer of uh, having of getting a voluntary friend uh, to the refugees um, we don't get uh, participants exclusively through the through the municipalities, but but the cooperation with the municipalities is an important, you could say, a backbone in the project because the municipalities have a systematic um, access to the target group. But we also get participants from our own activities like social cafes and uh, diaspora organizations and uh, by word of mouth. So when um, um, a refugee has been uh, put into contact with the coordinator, the municipality sort of steps out again, and then it's up to the coordinator to uh, find a volunteer and match um, the volunteer with the refugee. And that's where the magic happens. That's, that's in this match between these two people. And it's very much up to them to decide when to meet and what to do. And it's an open ended relationship that can la last as long as they um, as, as they find it meaningful to do so. Um, and then in addition to this, the, the organizations, they offer um, or we offer supervision, uh, often group supervision, and we offer training uh, courses and different types of uh, support materials to the volunteers. And what comes out of it, um, it's, 
depends uh, f- on sort of the different um, matches because it's, a, as I said, it's a highly individualized, needs-based effort. But we had a, um, an, um, um, an evaluation last year that showed some some trends um, and some common effects across th- um, across the matches and. We see that that there's an effect in terms of of getting a job or getting closer to the labor market, a sense of well-being and and security, improved language skills, better social network, uh, everyday coping gets better, a better uh, understanding of uh, Danish culture, sense of empowerment and ability to navigate the Danish system and so forth. And some of these effects are, are dynamically interlinked. Most importantly, we saw that that the sense of security and improved language skills uh, really opens up to a lot of other effects like um, feeling empowered and how to navigate uh, society as such. I just want to end with with this quote from a a Syrian woman um, who um, says the following about her voluntary friend. When I call her, she answers the phone. I know she does. I can talk to her about anything. And to me, this is a good expression of the sense of security and trust uh, that you can can establish um, if you have a good match and with this project. And very finally, um, if you want to know more about the project, you can visit our website. It's in Danish, but we have Google Translate and other measures. Some of it is in English. You can find um, an abridged version of uh, our evaluation in English, uh, and you can find the handbooks that we uh, make for um, that we made for participants, also in English. And otherwise, you can you're very welcome to to write me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mats, for all these uh, these updates from 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 Denmark and and a program that you've been developing, as you said, over time and getting almost all the municipalities involved. What's what's been the trick to get them involved, or or have have they lined up to 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 get started? What 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 is the attitude among the municipalities? It differs, mm-hmm. um, but I think what is important is that we. We have created a good balance where we are government funded, but we're also independent and we're an offer. They don't have to work with us, mm-hmm. but they can. Um, and I think the government funding has has given us a lot of um, um, they take us seriously because we're government funded mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. make it easy for them to work with us. Mm-hmm. And we make make it very clear to our volunteers that they understand the the role they have so they 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 don't step into the role of the municipality so Mm. we 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 complement each other Mm. and we work together with with them uh, quite actively and i think that's also important that when you see a a nice map of that we are almost everywhere underneath that map there is a lot of work on relations Mm. between Mm. the organizations and the municipalities Mm. You also mentioned that that you actually do try and reach out in with many different channels and also reach out to <clears throat> refugees who might have lived in Denmark quite some time but mm-hmm. still feel excluded or not as integrated. So uh, would you like to comment on that? Is is that a good way forward to actually use the program to, to really break, well, def- break uh, isolation in a broader sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, just because you've been in a country for some time doesn't mean that uh, that you're not challenged. Mm. And 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 you can remain a foreigner for a very long time. Mm. Um, so so it, it it definitely does it does make sense to mm. to um, to have a wider um, target group. Mm. Uh, but of course, if you're new in a country, the the needs are more acute mm. um, and obvious. Mm. We'll hear more also from the other countries very soon, because now it's time for for the panel discussion and we'll shift around. So I'll welcome uh, our other speakers. I'll move (coughs) over here so we have room at the table for all uh, you, all the four of you country representatives you've seen in the picture uh, previously. 
So now we have Mats uh, again from Denmark and then Johanna from Finland and uh, representing the Red Cross, actually both of you. So it's mm -hmm. Team Red Cross here. Yeah. And then we have Thorun <laughs> from Amnesty Iceland and Anna Kiselius from the municipality of Danderyd, just north of Stockholm. So great to have you back. Uh, I'm now really looking forward to some some sort of common discussion and, and reflections from your end now when you heard about all your different programs and, and approaches. Um, and we also have we have uh, received a few questions in the chat, but but don't forget that it's not too late. You can still uh, still post your questions there, and I'll, I'll I'll get them here on my phone so I can see what's going on there. Uh, I think um, maybe just to backtrack a little bit uh, and 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 get to the to to the to the core of this. Why is social inclusion so so important? Why should we do this? And 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 why do we need a, a formalized structure? To, to 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 make this interaction happening what do you think anna would you like to reflect on this uh, yes uh, thank you and it's been very rewarding to hear from uh, our other nordic countries and also i think uh, gila and lee they answered this question uh, quite well and i can only agree with what uh, gila foremost she was saying that integration is in a way two-folded and one one part of it is the but we would refer to as structural integration to become part of the system. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden, that means to have a personal security number, for example, being in contact with the overarching tax mm -hmm. <laughs> agency, mm -hmm. the migration board, having social insurance, uh, being informed, uh, being enrolled in formal language training and more formal like integration programming. Mm -hmm. But the other part, uh, which I believe is equally important, is the social inclusion. And that's the process, I believe, of feeling that you're part of the society in, mm. in which you live. Uh, the feeling of being welcomed, mm. of being valued, of feeling that you're part of the collective. Mm. So the sense of belonging, I mm. think, would be the definition of social inclusion mm. for me. And I think Gila, she, she defined that really well when telling about her experience. Yeah, I, I also really think so. Anyone who wants to add anything from, from your different perspectives? It's, it's the sense of belonging is a key word here. Um, I, I think so too. Yeah, and the ability to, to participate fully in society and mm. to realize your potential. Mm. Um, Another important. And, and, and do you see that there is a need for to have this formalized tractor? Is, is this something that, that will happen uh, on its own? Or what, what's the perspective from Iceland, for example? I mean, you haven't quite established that, no. that local program yet, but, yes. but you see the need. Yes, definitely. We need, need it to be formalized. Uh, basically, like uh, the nine elements that I was counting up here before, it, it, it's, uh, there's a focus on the, their um, needing to be a system around it to, make, to also hinder any kind of abuse of the system, abuse of work power, abuse mm -hmm. of the relationship and, you know, a hierarchy all that so um yes definitely there needs to be a, a system around it a forum uh something that ho holds together the uh, the whole project but i believe that it's gonna become an organic part of our society mm -hmm. in the long run i, I long hope run. so because i've seen that in other countries mm -hmm. but do you also agree that that there is a need to have a structure for for the social integration in in the maybe specifically in the nordic country i don't know what is the experience from from denmark here with with the different municipalities you work in you see it that it's an added value that you actually structure this uh, the matches the volunteers and the refugees uh, yeah, absolutely i mean um but I think it's important to, to mention that that there's a lot of sort of informal civil society integration happening. Mm. And, mm. and I mean, luckily, because mm. we can't uh, we can't do it all. And there's a lot of between neighbors and schools and all that. Mm. Um, and um, but w with this, obviously, it's important that 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 the matching is it happens, uh, as one of you guys mentioned, um, around common interests and 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 for it to work mm -hmm. um, because um, yeah and 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 we need to have a structure around it where we you know s uh, 
secure child protection and and GDPR and those things. So that's why it's important to have a, a sort of an organizational frame around it. Mm -hmm. And maybe okay. also to make sure to leave no one behind. I mean, so so that every refugee yeah. who, who comes, as you yeah. said as well, yeah. Anna, maybe, I mean, to, to see if you can match people already before they arrive, that, that that also creates a statement, like you are really welcome. So so I think that's also, that was also interesting to hear. And I, I think yes, as a civil right. society, I think we have to stress this civil society meaning also for integration. So it's not only authorities who are integrating people, but we have to have very strong civil societies, NGOs, other communities to take responsibility as well. And that's also a Nordic strength, right? Yeah, that's how right. we that's yeah. how we interact in the Nordic countries many times. You yeah. you join an organization and that's how you meet in France as well. We need to build on the know-how and the experience of all the ones that have already been in these uh, projects or or in this kind of work mm. and when we don't need to reinvent the wheel mm. and also we can uh, look outside of the nordics and at, at what um, the other countries that have a lengthy experience with community sponsorship have mm. done and they have encountered a lot of pro problems as well mm. and uh, ways to uh, solve them mm. we need to just use what's out there this is a movement where people actually really want to share mm -hmm. their know-how because mm -hmm. they want it to sp spread all over the world mm -hmm. so if, I, if cool. I may add to that yeah, please. <laughs> quickly because I, I definitely agree that there is a lot of initiatives already happening in the civil society and people in my experience they would like to meet there are many locals that would like to meet newcomers and many of the newcomers if not everyone that comes to us is the first thing they say we'd like mm -hmm. to get to know mm -hmm. Swedish people to practice language and this type of thing but they don't always really know how to meet. Mm. There are not so many, at least in Sweden, uh, arenas for this. Mm. And this is where I believe that community sponsorship can be such an effective tool because mm. it works as an entry point or as an icebreaker mm. directly into the society, mm. facilitating these social contexts, which would otherwise take, I think, much longer. Mm. No, I think I think you're 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 absolutely right there. I mean, that's testament to, to what all of you have said here. Uh, if we talk a little bit, I mean, it's it's also you talked about uh, a lot of the, the, the values and, and all the great things about this, but but I'm sure that there are challenges as well. And and I don't know if you want to mention a few or think of what, what can be the, 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 the main challenges in setting up these programs or for the refugees themselves to get to get them involved and, and on board and starting to get integrated. If you want to comment on that. I've heard of, uh, I, I, you know, not in the Nordic countries, but I've heard of like there's been sometimes issues with the matching. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't actually really fit, mm -hmm. but they've figured out ways to to solve that. You know, that, that people are not going to be uh, unmatched and then not have anybody. They, they have a whole system now around that if that happens, if there's some kind of a mismatch. Sometimes there's trust issues mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. it's quite often from those that are being welcomed. Mm. Uh, because they they find it sometimes unbelievable that people want to be so welcoming and oh. there must be something else behind it. So mm. I've heard stories like that, but mm. uh, mostly yeah. very positive mm. stories. But uh, mm. yeah, things like that have come up. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you seen anything similar? Or do you have no, any? but no, I, I agree that there needs to be this backup system. That that's yeah. that's was on my drawing. There was this consultant up in the corner, and and they they give backup and they. We we um, we tell those being matched that they can pull out any time and they can get help and so forth. And uh, but I also find it interesting that in Dandrud you want to match them before they even arrive because mm -hmm. our methodology is that we people have to meet before we can match them because we we also been wanting to match before and like mm -hmm. um, on the train station or in the airport, mm -hmm. uh, but we have found that difficult because that X factor or that sort of human component. Um, in our experience needs to be there so there needs to be a match meeting mm -hmm. where everyone agrees that that they want to be in a match together mm -hmm. um yeah i mean that also makes sense they're different would mm -hmm. you like to comment on this what how, how did you think about it when you, when you think about yes. this early match making well, of course it, it would be voluntary <laughs> i'd like to add we're not just to forcing someone into a match mm -hmm. Uh, and we have some background information about the family arriving and we will have a lot of background information about the people signing up to become welcome guides. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I believe that we can make a good and sustainable 
match or we can try anyway mm. and they will meet through a, a video call mm. ideally or at least a phone call mm. but there's no guarantee that it would be a good match mm. or that it would work out we'll do we'll do our best but mm. otherwise we could we could change we're involved throughout the entire process mm. and like you said also they can pull out at any time and you can be offered uh, another match mm. but an, another like aspect that we've had in our program is you're speaking about difficulties a little bit is that it required uh, much more PR to recruit welcome guides than what I expected mm -hmm. from, from mm -hmm. the beginning and that we maybe accounted for also in our communications budget. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a lesson learned from us that the recruitment of welcome guides will most likely not happen on its own, mm -hmm. but it requires like continuous outreach and promotion of the program. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to ask that as well. How, how does it work in reality with and what is the interest uh, among volunteers and how you get them? Maybe you wanted to comment earlier as well. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, that, yeah, perhaps, I was just thinking of, of uh, well, in Finland, we had a friend family system for, for decades. So that's kind of a matching of people together mm -hmm. and they might be individuals or then they are, in a way, they work as a group. But and in this um, community uh, community mentor activity, we are uh, kind of uh, trying to build uh, those community mentors as a group. So they will join the group and they will uh, meet with refugees. And afterwards, mm. they see who is to become matching to who. Mm -hmm. or if they are individual matching or if there's uh, some group activity they want to do it together but so the, the, the both parties both parties are uh, planning the activity together so we are not kind of an offer or match mm -hmm. persons together so it's it's kind of a slightly different mm -hmm. uh, idea we have this more more organic mm -hmm. process well yeah mm -hmm. yeah Maybe. we'll see what happens yeah. <laughs> But what is the situation in Denmark when it comes to attracting volunteers to be those welcoming guides? It it takes a, a constant effort. I mean, it does in all in all voluntary work. There is you can't. Some people come by their own sort of uh, or on their own. But you also have to do targeted Facebook advertising. You have to have information meetings locally. You have to do all sorts of things. Mm. Um, so it's yeah that's like a, just a a premise you have to do that in our experience is there a typical person that becomes this uh, this uh, volunteer person i kind of figure myself like uh, are, you woman potential? With, <laughs> are you a potential I, one? I am one of those actually i i do yeah. work or i mean i i i've volunteered myself but you know i, I think of, of of women sort of above my age with slightly older children who has more time to to do this but maybe that's just a stereotype and a prejudice that i have what's your experience anna from from dandre do you have a mix of people in your volunteer team Mm, I think the stereotype is quite accurate in our, in our <laughs> yes, context as well. Yeah. There, there is a majority of, of women uh -huh. and we try actively to engage more men as well as mm. we would like to have a balance. So we do have men that are involved as well. But many, I would say, they're actually yeah, well, middle-aged women, but also perhaps women mainly that are a little bit older perhaps mm. retired mm -hmm. and i think that group is is important as well because they have they have they quite have a bit of time yeah. yes yeah yeah and engagement mm. um yeah. another thing that i thought of uh, Mats, you mentioned that you've been doing this evaluation of the program quite recently <clears> and uh we all know it's very very difficult to measure success when we work with social issues and trying to measure social impact but but what came out did were there any specific metrics or indicators that you that were used uh, in in this uh, in this evaluation that, that that you think could be valuable for others as well to use to try and understand if if the if the results are yeah, or if, if the programs are going in the right way yeah well first of all our donor um, the government agency they've been very eager to have quantitative measures of our the effect and that mm. has been incredibly difficult mm. to give them mm. uh, because you can't really isolate the effect of what you do because mm. it's evolves all aspects of life mm. so what we have done is is go about it more qualitatively and we've interviewed both refugees and caseworkers in the municipalities mm. 
and uh, volunteers themselves and we made um, um, surveys to to um, municipalities mm -hmm. so so we have a, like a, a second hand um, sort of um, estimation of, of, of how it's going mm -hmm. um, and based on then what refugees say or the impact for them or, or what they have yeah what the municipal case work is because they then yeah. they might have a, a citizen who's been part of this and someone who's not and they can compare it mm -hmm. um, so yeah. What what about uh, in in Danderyd? Have you have you also? I mean, you you mentioned that you're working with Uppsala University. Uh, so uh, are they also developing some kind of metrics or indicators to, uh, to measure? Yes, success? and we are very grateful that we're doing this together <laughs> with the university and, mm -hmm. and the researchers because it is like you said, it is difficult, mm -hmm. I, I believe. And the way they are doing it, they will conduct uh, surveys to gather feedback from our participants. So in the different municipalities, it would be a comparative evaluation at the end. Uh, they're starting this in Tandred uh, next month, actually. Oh. And I know they're going to ask the newcomers about like the experience of the program, the integration pro progress by looking into certain factors, such as like language acquisition, participation in community activities and employment rate. Mm -hmm. And then they think there are many, many more things that they will ask mm. as well. Mm. Um, but I think an important success factor is also to involve the newcomers themselves, both in the program design and in the evaluation part of this, because mm. they have a lot of like experience and perspectives that are very important mm. when wanting to create successful social mm. inclusion programs. Mm. Doran, this is something you mentioned as well, that these programs have to develop together with the target group, so to speak. Uh, on, on your international scale of working with Amnesty, do you have any metrics? I mean, you, you mentioned these nine principles to build a good program. Are there also any indicators connected to those where you can see if, if they then apply or uh, how, would, how would you do that? That's a good, difficult question. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure I understood it, actually. No, but no, I mean, it, if, if Amnesty also, I mean, while promoting uh, yeah. promoting community sponsorship, is there also, a, a, based on the different country experiences with these programs, have you also developed any indicators to measure success or how the programs are working or what kind of results they deliver? No, we haven't really made a, a, a one good way of... of um, seeing the results of that we, we actually just are looking at individual case bases different countries we have to look at the different context of the societies that uh, we're looking at each time because mm. these are these are actually all over the i mean this we're talking about argentina mm. australia new zealand ireland they're so different the societies are so different mm. so there are different models that need to be set up to, oh, yeah. to fit to each uh um, right, right. society mm -hmm. but um the general consensus is that this is still the way to go of mm -hmm. course we've seen different problems arise in different countries because of the different kind of communities we're talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. but the consensus is that this is definitely something that is going to be ever growing and it seems to be ever growing because we do not have a single country that has decided to start a, a community sponsorship program that has set, since stopped Mm -hmm. It just grows. It yeah. seems to be a growing that, that thing. That is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this also, of course, leads leads me over to when when you're now in Iceland in this phase where you are, where you're you're you know planning to start something and 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 working with the government on this. Uh, what do you think you can learn from the Nordic countries? Also talking about uh, societies that have more of a similar model of of, of welfare state and and certain you know uh, social social welfare system that actually pays for a lot of the, the things that in other countries need to be volunteer based so uh, what what would be your main takeaways from today you think for 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 the icelandic uh, well, perspective that's we can actually make a different kind of model that fits with our nordic way of of, of being because um one of the issues that we had at the beginning when we spoke about this in iceland was that this financial aspect that was part of the promoting that we were doing because it doesn't actually fit with the, the our social system the way we i mean it doesn't fit with the rights that every single uh, person has to have in our society so mm -hmm. it was kind of a barrier now that we've seen that the other nordic countries are setting up models where this is not a component 
the financial, the fundraising, all that kind of element that has been part of it in Canada and America mm. and or the States and mm. all over. Um, this, this is something that we will be taking from the other Nordic countries. And of course, uh, other experience that there have been just this, the organization. Yeah, uh, yeah every, everything. everything. We, we, will, we want to learn everything from our uh, Nordic uh, brothers that's, and that's sisters. That's the great benefit of yeah. Nordic collaboration, as we yeah. always say here, uh, within the Nordic collaboration. That's what we do. Yes, yeah, you're not, I, I think the, what, what you just said, I think it's a huge difference yeah. if you compare it to the Nordic countries and other countries who has a long history. But the fundraising is one of one crucial issue for volunteers and we don't have it mm. so we have to ask ourselves what are we doing what what extra value we are bringing for, with this community model mm -hmm. but i think it's really a huge difference so so mm. it's it has to be kind, kind of a nordic mm. uh, concept mm -hmm. yeah. altogether yeah. we could talk about tax uh, reductions like the French are doing. <laughs> yeah that yeah. could be another <laughs> yeah. another thing sorry um, now i think we'll, we'll move over because i got quite a few questions here from from the chat as well so we're really happy for that and want to thank you for for adding these uh, so one, um, yeah, and one question we actually uh, for you, Mats, was how do you attract native native volunteers to participate? And I think we already discussed this question quite a bit, uh, working with with different channels. And uh, I don't know if you want to comment any further on this, uh, but uh, I also thought of this uh, another question: What do you do uh, with with those who who are seeking asylum, who are still waiting for the decision? Uh, not the quota refugees then, but and you talked about that you reach out to to broader groups as well. Mm. Do you have any specific outreach also to those people who still live in a big uncertainty? Um, well, the uncertainty is common to all refugees in Denmark because you have to have reevaluated your Ooh, um, yes. your permit to stay every one or two years mm -hmm. um so that's very common that's the psycho social psychosocial psycho horrible word mm -hmm. support there where that comes in mm -hmm. but also helping those people in, in in sort of maneuvering in that mm -hmm. um, this project doesn't um, help people in the asylum phase mm -hmm. um in denmark you have to be an asylum center if you're seeking mm -hmm. asylum and mm -hmm. having been granted a permit mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. So it's those who've been been relocated into municipality. Mm. That's where we step in with this, and we have other programs for the for the centres. Right, yeah. and that is similar in Danderyd, right? You work with the ones who are placed in Danderyd. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. The asylum seekers they fall under different legislation uh, mm. a little bit, so we do not work that much towards mm. that group. Mm. And also, there are very few actually asylum mm. seekers in in our municipality. Mm. But we do include, so we do not only work with uh, quota refugees, we do include like asylum seekers that have been granted residency mm -hmm. and have been like resettled into our municipality. We do work with that group as well, but not those in the process of seeking asylum. No. In Finland, is it similar or do you also, do you have any outreach? Well, yes, we have a lot of uh, activities for asylum seekers, but it's not uh, the task in our pilot project because mm -hmm. we have a uh, funding from mm. from you you and it says it's 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 for quota refugees only but of course if we have a uh, open meeting places and things so we don't ask any statuses fr from people but everybody is welcomed but we have uh, quite a lot uh, activities also in reception centers and mm. uh, f uh, families and friend families and all kinds of uh, integration language groups and so on mm. It's part of the Red Cross. It's a part of uh, the Red Cross activities. and other uh, organizations as well. Mm. All right. Uh, I think that was a good, good answer to that question. Although, yeah, we also understand that it's a very delicate situation for people waiting for asylum. Uh, another question here is, is more uh, sort of on a, on, a, on a broader scale. And I think you touched upon it, Anna, uh, in this world where we know that the, the uh, migration levels or the, the number of migrants is uh, constantly increasing with the number of wars and also climate uh, 
climate issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, how how can we do to increase additionality? Uh, and this is a concept that we, maybe you could also explain that so so everyone understands uh, what what we're talking about. But do you see that your programs also uh, can also add to increasing the willingness to actually uh, receive more refugees or work with this additionality in in a, in a in a better way or yeah, to, to increase reception of, of, of refugees. What, what do you think? Do you have any comment on that? Oh, it's, it's, oh, well, it's a difficult question, yes. But um, I think it's possible if we um, kind of uh, strengthen the communities so that uh, NGOs or civil society is strong and takes, takes some responsibility, not from authorities though, but uh, creates such a good system that uh, it's easy to, we can uh, kind of a guarantee that we are involved mm -hmm. if more refugees are, are coming or mm -hmm. more migrants are coming. Mm -hmm. So it's a strong uh, statement mm -hmm. in municipality. So maybe those municipalities also can add some extra refugees mm. uh, for uh, to stay there. Mm. If we say we are also here, mm. so mm. trust us, we are here. Mm -hmm. Because Anna, you mentioned that in 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 your case, for example, that you think that if the program is important to also well change or impact somehow the public opinion on on or towards refugees, that when when you see that it's yeah, when you become friends <laughs> and yes. they are not such strange people. Exactly. So I don't know, do you think yeah. it can have a bigger effect as well? Or... Um, definitely, <clears throat> I think that the program can influence the, the public debate and help to like balance the narrative regarding the, the refugee reception. Mm. And it can influence voters <laughs> probably mm. and in that way in the longer run. I cannot speak about like complementary pathway or additionality as such into the Swedish context. Mm. But in changing the narrative, I think it does have a very positive impact. Mm. What do you think from Amnesty's point of view? Did you discuss this issue a lot? Yes, we do actually, because mm. uh, I think it's, well, it's, it's very important to hear a lot of success stories. Mm. Um, uh, for, yeah, there, there are so many. There's such a beautiful connection that so many people have made, mm -hmm. and it goes vice versa. It's it's a very mutually beneficial relationship, mm -hmm. and that needs to be um, advertised or you know really uh, published out there. To, that this is uh, just something that really affects societies, mm -hmm. and uh, should become a social norm. Actually, I think, mm -hmm. and I, and a lot uh, of other uh, countries are kind of moving that way mm -hmm. uh, and the government should be able to see because of that that this would actually relieve them of a little bit of a um, uh, burden or mm -hmm. uh, responsibility when there are so many more that come into this process because in the long run we of course think that it's not going to only be civil society this, th these are going to be laymen these are going to be families that mm -hmm. normally wouldn't be doing anything like this that's that's what we see or, or hope to see mm. so so definitely additionality should be uh the long time term goal Add right to, yes right uh i think that that are some 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 strong strong arguments here for for this issue uh we are getting many questions so big thanks for that uh and and some of them build on things that we already touched upon uh, someone is asking, but uh, how come that so so many more women are volunteering to follow a sponsorship? What is their motivation? And does this influence the composition of the group that benefits from the programs? Uh, I guess there is no such connection. I mean, you're, but you, as you said, you, you, you're you working with different channels to attract uh, as diverse group as possible, I guess, as volunteers. But, but uh, I don't think it 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 doesn't influence the composition of the group that benefits because those are they are the refugees who are there anyways so so that's a different story um but um and then it was another question about this that if the programs uh, mainly cover refugees who have received asylum and yes just to clarify that that's that's the that's the general uh, rule that 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 the programs uh, target people who have asylum but but that 
Red Cross and other civil society organizations do a lot of work also with those seeking asylum to support them. And another interesting question here uh, was if you had any reflections on how this program uh, is actually strengthening the role of civil society as a democratic actor or as a you know a, an important actor in society and you touched upon this as well very much just recently yeah. so so uh, yeah talking about that as a way to reassure uh, also politicians that that we can handle yeah. an influx of, of of refugees when civil society is engaged because it's that is the way to also mobilize uh, personal and other right. uh, resources. Right. And I think um, also in, in this um, community model is one uh, important thing is to um, the strengthen the community as well in, in the municipality. Mm. So, so of course, there are already many organizations, many parties there, but they are they haven't been mainly they haven't been working closely together. Mm. So I think during this process, we can have those parties work together closely. So it's, it makes the uh, community stronger. Mm. And also it gives the uh, for refugees, it gives more different opportunities. Also, if we can have more men, for example, mm -hmm. to, to be active there. And you have many different kinds of organizations involved, different kinds, like the yes. sports clubs, as well yes. as maybe yeah, the exactly. chess club and, yeah. and also yeah. Yeah. a nature organization. Yeah. Right. So we have to, yeah. So yeah. we have to uh, keep asking different organizations mm -hmm. to join together, to make plans together mm -hmm. and open this community for refugees as well. And I think this is a segue to another question that I had. But first of all, just someone, uh, what is uh, your experience with the participation of especially families in activities outside their residential areas in terms of motivation? I mean, do you experience challenges with motivating their continuous participation? I think this was a little bit unclear if, if it's uh, refugee families, then uh, I, I don't know exactly what's meant with this question. Another question is, how do you guarantee the commitment of the volunteers in the long run to avoid someone being matched and then disappearing after meeting one or two times? I think you, you uh, explained this and that this is an important part of these programs that you actually get a chance to, to get a new match if the first one didn't work out and that there is no guarantee that the first match does work out. I mean, you have to build, it's, it's about building relationships. I don't know if you want to come in any. Further. Yeah, maybe just it's the, the add that the matching is important, but also the recruiting is important. Mm -hmm. So it starts really with re recruiting some volunteers that you see are fit for the task. Mm. And then you do a, a good match and then you support it mm. over the time. Mm. So I think that's those three elements uh, should all be there. Mm. Yeah. No. I, I think in community work, you also need those a lot of organizations to work together and also they can uh, if they can find a, 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 a common idea of what they do so then they can also share the responsibility so it's not only for one organization or two organizations together um, maybe five maybe five organizations together so they are in a structurally they are strong Mm. And it's it's um, it gives a uh, future a hope for this uh, system to to be able to. But go this on. is a little different than having mm. personal volunteers. Yeah, because it's, it's because the personal yeah. volunteers might not even be connected to an organization, right? I mean, mm. they are just persons who want to step in and, and support yeah. these people. But of course, you can work if you're a municipality and thinking of setting up these structures. You can work mm. both ways. It can be an individual, one-on-one -on -one system, but then as importantly mm. to mobilize. The civil society organizations yeah. to see what they can offer in terms of of activities and 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 support uh, yeah. probably i i had another the, the other question I, I thought of just before we wrap up this is also if there is an urban rural dimension to this if you've seen that the, the engagement is stronger in smaller communities where there might be more uh need for labor for for yeah for young families to actually move in and where they might be even more eager to get people to actually stay on do you have any comment on that, Johanna, from, from the diversity of, of well, yeah. you work with? Yeah, the small, small 
small uh, communities or small municipalities can have very warm hearts mm. and it's easy to to integrate into into small villages mm. and um, if the community works well so there are a lot of different kinds of parties to, to partners to to mm. support those newcomers mm. but of course there are also these issues of work or employment or studying or mm. or uh, even to um, how to maintain your own culture or language mm. if you are just few refugees mm. Mm. in a small village but there are there are good really are good parts mm. also there mm. So I think we need to, to really underline this as well, that other yeah. studies that we have done also say that, tell us that, that one of the main challenges in the Nordic countries right now is our aging population and that we have a lack of labor. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of uh, mismatch in the Nordic labor markets and we need a lot of new labor. So it's not that refugees are a burden, they are, they are welcome to come and join our labor force. Um, I think uh, that was sort of a final, uh, final question for also time is running up here, but, but but I don't know if you just wanted a, a, a final round or comments on on the idea for a, for a, this Nordic model of a, of community sponsorship, and if there is anything else that you would like to pass on to municipalities or other actors who are listening and want to set up this kind of system, is it just do it, or do we have any <laughs> other any other? message that you are coming yeah. looking at you I'm not okay sorry. <laughs> thank you uh, yes I believe that we have a lot, lot to learn from each other and that there's a lot of potential for developing a Nordic model uh, we have similar welfare systems and we do not have this financial component from the sponsors and that makes our programs in a way similar even mm. though the differences and within the Swedish national context I also think that we can support each other in this and anyone is welcome to, <laughs> to send me an email and we'll, it's part of our objective to help other municipalities in starting up and implementing this program. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out. And again, we'll share the slides with email addresses afterwards and also can also write them in this email that all of you will receive who signed up to this webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Thorin, yeah, well, what do you say? Well, I think it would be very beneficial for us all to be connected in some kind of a network where we can uh, share and help each other build our programs wherever we are situated in that timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said at the beginning of my talk, uh, there is no community sponsorship program in Iceland, but it's a work in progress. And I really think that uh, it's going to be happening soon. And when it happens, I look forward to becoming a sponsor, ally, welcoming guide myself. So uh, exactly. yeah. yes, uh, thank you so much for inviting us to. Uh, talk about well, thank you uh, situation. thank you johanna what do you say what's the most well, important to think of to well, get started I, I, with this i think uh well we have we have um, one year already in for this project and we have two two years to go mm. and uh i'm sure uh in finland this community mentor system is not going to stop when the project stops mm. so we are going to be happy to develop these uh, concepts together mm -hmm. with Nordic partners. Mm -hmm. And make sure your government or local governments join the program so yeah. they can yeah. support it long yeah. term. Yeah. Sounds very good, promising. Mats, what do you say? Yes, uh, um, what to think about um, our experience. I mean, it's interesting to hear uh, and it'll be interesting to follow the Swedish model where it's local government driven and then it has a, a volunteer component because uh, in in our case it's it's um, it's driven by civil society and we cooperate with uh, with the municipality because we see that if volunteers they don't want to be free labor of the municipality they want to have space to sort of um, engage in their own right mm. and they so so that would be my um, um, my suggestion that that you you consider carefully how to treat these volunteers and, and make sure that that you don't kill their motivation to actually meet other people and not be part of the municipality mm -hmm. sort of officially but actually meet other people and 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 help them so yeah. that would be yeah. one pointer i think keep, it's important keep, keep that spirit but you also actually 
collaborate with with I mean with the civil society group that helps you with the volunteer matchmaking, right? Yes, that's that's very important mm -hmm. for us. Maybe I didn't emphasize that enough, but that's a very important factor. We don't tie them to us as a municipality, but mm -hmm. into this volunteer community. Mm -hmm. So I really I think and I hope that they do not feel like laborers for our municipality. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fine line between being a free laborer and a, a volunteer, but it's also all that added value that you get when you actually uh, build new relationships and meet new people from other parts of the world uh, that helps you grow. And we do always think that we know everything in the Nordic countries, but actually we don't. There is a whole world out there to, to learn from. So that's another important point, I think, that we should welcome people to us and, and be happy that they want to settle in our cold uh, northern world uh, so so that's that's really great but with that i want to thank you so much for for joining us today for coming all the way to stockholm and also for participating in the panel and then we'll just wrap up the program with our our friends kaisa and erika but thank you so thank much you. again thank you thank you thank you Kajsa and Erika, Kajsa Kepsu from the Nordic Welfare Center and Erika Lövgren from UNHCR. So the program is coming to an end and uh, I know you've been listening very carefully and I'm uh, just really curious to hear your uh, reflections. What, what, what did you learn today? What were some major takeaways for you, Erika? Maybe you want to start. Well, I can just say that I found it truly inspiring to listen to all the speakers and to hear about all these very interesting experiences and to see as well that the Nordic countries, they have so much in common and they also have their differences as well, but there, there's so much in common and there, there's so many opportunities to share these experiences. I think this is uh, very important. I mean, cooperation is very important in, the, in this in this area. And uh, so that's, I think that's my main kind of takeaway from today. And, uh, and also that we need to talk about, we need to talk to each other. We need to see how does it work over in your country? How does it work in your municipality? What can mm. we learn from that? Mm. How can we not restart from the beginning, but how can we actually take what you are doing and bring it into our context? And I think that's, that's very important. And what I'm looking forward to now is to con continue these discussions and to, uh, to also more clearly put the need for social inclusion and this type of projects like community sponsorship and similar initiatives on the agenda. Mm. And this is something that is crucial for success successful integration mm. and for in the long run also to open up for more resettlement places and for that more people can come to the Nordic countries and mm. seek protection, which was already the topic of today. So this will be part of your advocacy work uh, towards uh, Nordic, Nordic and Baltic governments, I guess. And Definitely. And yeah. together with these great stakeholders that we have today mm -hmm. here present. And I also just want to say thank you so much again for hosting this event. So yeah. thank you for to Nordregio and to Nordic Welfare Center and to Kaisa and also of course. Yeah. So, so we thank are, you so we much. Are, uh, we are always to happy continue. to facilitate this because this is uh, what we do, right, Kaisa? This is this is a very the very core part of our work, this Nordic this... Nordic knowledge and experience exchange. Exactly. Kaisa, what did you take away from uh, today? Well I I can only echo what's been said and the panel has said it already so nicely. So um well we always here to live and learn from each other and mm -hmm. and also this collaboration with the UNHCR. I want to thank you, Erika, and, and uh, for this possibility that you you came to us with this idea and we and we have learned here now at the Nordic uh, Welfare Center and the Nordic Co Cooperation on, on more about this initiative yeah. in particular. Mm -hmm. And we, we want to uh, highlight also this factor about in social inclusion much more now in our work. Mm -hmm. I think that's one key take, to, take away for our work. Uh, and, and you will follow up this meeting or this webinar as well with mm. meeting now with these uh, stakeholders. Yes, we will keep, to, keep discussing. To keep, yes. keep the, yes, the network uh, growing and yeah. going and, and keep learning from each other. Uh, super. Okay. All right. I think Thank with you. that, it's actually three o'clock sharp. And, and uh, then uh, the rest of, of, of the day is yours. And we will just thank you so much, everyone who joined us live today and also for all the questions you post in the chat and other comments. And also big thanks to our chat moderators, Helena and Stefan. 
and thanks to you guys and to all our speakers here today. Again, we recorded this webinar, luckily, for those of you who couldn't follow online uh, in the direct uh, direct broadcast here. So you'll, you'll get the recording and also all the, the PowerPoint slides uh, that were presented today and contact information, because as you heard, all our speakers are very eager to keep, keep up the dialogue with you out, out there across the Nordics and beyond. So anyways, thank you so much for today. Have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you.